I want to hand over and start our day and kick off and say that this Agile Day is open. I want to start introducing our first speaker, Linda Rising. Um, I remember actually the first time when I came across Fearless Change, when Jutta Eckstein mentioned that there's a great book in the making. Jutta just recently spoke at one of our user group meetings. She got a sneak preview of the book. For me, it was an easy transition to Linda's work because I was heavily influenced by patterns to the great work of, originated by Christopher Alexander in the Game of Four. So I picked up the book and studied the patterns catalog of organizational change. Linda's catalog serves as an essential guide to anybody who is transitioning teams or entire organizations alike. She gave those patterns names, grouped them, and most important to us, she published them. One of the patterns is called Do Food, to make an ordinary gathering a special event by including food. With Linda at the Agile Day, we are confident that we already have a very special event. Nonetheless, we still serve food. It is my pleasure to introduce Linda Rising, an internationally known presenter on patterns, retrospectives, agile development, and the change process. Linda delivered the keynote at the Agile 2011 conference in Salt Lake City. Therefore, the talk was voted among the participants as one of the best, if not the best, among more than 200 sessions of talk. We are proud to have her here in New York at the Agile Day. Please welcome Linda Rising. New York City. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah. What an honor, what a privilege to be here with you on this great Agile Day. I haven't been to New York City for a couple of years, but it's always a pleasure to come back. I used to live in New Jersey, so I don't know whether that counts. We're, we're working on this. So, while we're waiting, I hope, for a slide to come up, I want to say that this is a talk that is about fearless change, but it's also going to be about a lot of research. And I know that it's not an academic presentation, I don't want to spend a lot of time on citations, but it's often the case that people become interested in some of the research around the topic and they would like to know more. So I'm offering you the chance, if you would like the references or places to go to read more about the kinds of things I'm going to be talking about, please send me some email. I hope the first slide will come up and it will have my email address on it. We're working on it. Then. Please send me some email asking for more information. You can also go to my website, which will also be on the slide. And you can find lots of articles about the patterns. Of course, I hope you'll have the book, but it's not necessary. I've written enough about these patterns so that you can get all the information from my website. So we are waiting, are we not? No, we, oh no. Oh, the problems, okay. The hardware problem, folks. Somebody will come in. Let, let me begin with a commercial. So we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, one of the jobs I have is an editor of IEEE software. And I decided to take on that task because the IEEE publications seem to me to be closed to real practitioners. It's become very academic. Not that academic publications aren't worthwhile. But I feel that the stories from the trenches are also worthwhile. So this new series, it is a column, I guess you could say, for IEEE software, is very different. It doesn't have a heavy-duty review process. It doesn't have heavy-duty requirements as to length or academic language. And it is there specifically so that people can hear your stories. I believe in the power of stories. I talked to a couple of people just this morning 
who told me about great things they are doing with agile development. They're putting their own little spin on it. They're trying experiments. And those of us who are interested in agile or software development in the large would love to hear those stories. So I encourage you to send me, once this information gets up here, send me your ideas for stories. Don't spend a lot of time putting a paper together. Just send me an idea, and I can promise you a quick turnaround as to whether or not you need to spend a lot of time on that paper. So I'm hoping that those of you who are sitting here with an idea for a paper will take this opportunity. Yes, here we are. Send it to me, Linda, at lindarising.org. Just an idea that you have for a paper that you might like to see in IEEE software. Yay, we are back in business. Good. This is a presentation about patterns. So I make the assumption that you know what a pattern is. Let's have a show of hands. Everybody know what a pattern is. Have run into the Gang of Four book, which was published a long time ago, actually, in 1995 and is still translated into more languages, still being sold today, has transformed in a similar way to the transformation by Agile, how we think about software. And what we know is that the idea of patterns is much larger than software. Joe mentioned Christopher Alexander, who was the person who put the idea of patterns in front of us, saying this is a good way to learn from experience capture knowledge, and give it a name. So we have been using patterns in the software community for a long time, well over a decade. And what we know is that there are patterns for all kinds of things, not just software design, but also software testing, configuration management, customer interaction. And these patterns are about introducing ideas, trying to encourage organizational change. I once did a training class in another country where someone asked me, how can we make people do Agile? How can we force people to do Agile? Wouldn't that be the ideal solution to any innovation problem? Why don't we just force people to do that? You think that's a good idea? Wouldn't that be simpler? If we could just force people to do something? I mean, clearly high-level executives have that power in an organization. They can force people to do things. I once heard a statement by the Vice President of Cisco. He said, if I have an initiative and people decide not to follow it, I simply fire them. Well, I'm here to tell you that's very effective. <laughs> it does work. The problem with that, of course, is that if that high level enforcer goes away or stops paying attention. So if there's a new initiative on the table in the next week or month, then all of that agreement as to whether or not that idea was a good one goes away. It disappears. People just forget about that new idea because they know that next month it's something else. Anybody have any experience with that? Yeah, it's sort of the idea of the month. And what you get out of an initiative like that is compliance. People will line up. They will do as long as you are enforcing. And that's not really what the patterns I'm going to talk about strive to do. I believe that the only effective way to change organizations is to encourage people to see why you believe the idea is a good one and to encourage them to adopt the idea because they believe it's the right thing to do. And that cannot happen overnight. 
And it cannot happen by exercising power over individuals. Let's take another poll. It's a good thing to do in the morning to keep people awake. How many smart people in the room? <laughs> oh, come on, this is New York City. How many smart people in the room? Yes, yes, very good. And, and because you are smart people, you are rational thinkers. That's how you make decisions, rationally. Oh, come on. Yes? Rational thinker? Okay, totally. Are you married? <laughs> Was that a rational decision? I hate to say this, but I have met people who did decide to marry someone or not based on a decision tree. Is that how you did it? Did, did you make a little list, a little table, and you said, okay, here are the pros on one side, here are the cons on the other, and then you had some kind of priority ranking, and then an evaluation, and you said, therefore, did you do that? No, you didn't do that. But it was a rational decision? Maybe not. So here's, uh, here's the epitome of rationality. And he is even maybe admitting that. Maybe because I'm embarrassing him just a little bit. Maybe some decisions, some decisions might not be rational. Maybe. Maybe. Well, I'm sorry, but what the cognitive scientists are telling us now is that none, as, as in zero, none of our decisions are rational. That's really difficult. My husband says, you know why you go around the world giving these weird talks about how your brain works and patterns and things like that is you're trying to convince yourself. You don't like it. And maybe deep down, you don't believe it. But you think if you just say it over and over and over again that maybe it'll click. And you'll say, okay, those scientists who do all this research on how our brains work, maybe they do have something I don't know. Because I want to hang on to that idea of rational decisions. Because it makes life easier. And if you're smart and you're a rational thinker, then if you want to convince somebody that your idea is a good one, whether it's agile development or something else, that all you have to do is outline a nice, rational argument, and those other smart people who work with you will listen to that nice, rational argument and be convinced. So just get out your PowerPoint slides and make a few bullets about the benefits of agile development and present it to the people in your organization and that's it. Anybody try that? It didn't work? Oh my God. Well, do you suppose that means those people are not very smart? <laughs> What it is, those people, those people, they just don't get it. Because clearly, if we make a nice rational argument for the idea, if people truly are rational, that should be sufficient. Well, maybe what the cognitive scientists are telling us is true that the reason why people decide to do Agile or to adopt anything else in an organization is not based on 
some kind of rational decision. Maybe it's based on something else. Now, if you're okay, I'll tell you the rest of the story, which is not only that you're not a rational decision maker, but you don't know and can't know why you made the decisions you made, including the one about getting married. You don't know. And you have no way of knowing. It's all hidden from us. Now what we are very good at is explaining to someone else after we've already made the decision why we did it. We can outline a nice rational argument for that. That's called rationalization. I can tell you why I did something. But that outline, that rational argument, has nothing to do with the real reason. So these patterns are here to give you another set of tools. Not just rational argument. I'm not telling you to throw that out. I'm just telling you, you need more than that. I'm going to give you some other tools. These are patterns, and they are based on the experience of successful change agents. And they also turn out to be based on a lot of good research in cognitive scientists who tell us how our brains work. And I will try to share as much of that as I can. So I just need to move over here and do that. So these are my favorite. We don't have time to cover all the patterns in the book. There are 48. Mary Lynn and I have continued to write patterns. We have 13 new ones that are on the website. I'm just going to give you what I think are the most important. And I hope this will be a little teaser so that you can walk out of here and have some good ideas when you go back to your organization. So let's look at the very first one. It's called Evangelist. Now, I just moved from Phoenix, Arizona to Nashville, Tennessee, and I want to tell you what evangelist means. I'm not sure what it means in New York City, but it has to do with religion, serious, serious religion. And at first, we didn't really like the name. We thought, are we really talking about religion here? Would that be the best? name for the pattern, and we debated back and forth, and finally we realized that is exactly what we're talking about. We are talking about belief. We are talking about religion. I have another talk that I've started giving that has as an abstract, could Agile be a placebo? You know what a placebo is? Anybody ever heard of it? What's it mean? What is a placebo? A placebo means something, I'm sorry, I'm not sure how well my voice projects. You're great. <laughs> I, you need to get up here and I need to sit down. Yeah. What a, a placebo is something that you administer to someone that is supposedly a drug, but it is in fact uh, you know, something that's completely benign and, and has no effect. It might be a sugar pill. Yeah. You somebody is a drug that they Yeah, so you're giving somebody uh, some kind of medication. Could even be a shot. A pill could be surgery. It has re no effect, really. It's just sham. Now, what's the amazing thing about a placebo? Many times. Many times it works. In fact, I read an interesting study just yesterday about echinacea. Anybody take echinacea for colds? So it doesn't work. <laughs> that, that you can clearly show by using placebo. But if you tell people that you are taking echinacea, they get better. So there's the power of, the power of what? It's the power of your brain. 
you're walking around with a brain that has a little pharmacy in it. If we could just turn on what it is that you have on the shelves of that pharmacy, you wouldn't need to take so many drugs. Well, unless you wanted to. I mean, you know, there are those other drugs. Caffeine, and we're surrounded by drugs. So it's the power of belief. So that's essential. If you're going to be somebody who's going to change your organization, or your team, or your department, if you don't believe, it won't happen. It's a requirement. There's a reason why that pattern is first. It's necessary to believe. And I say believe because usually when you start out with Agile or any idea, you've either just read about it or heard about it or you talked to somebody else who's doing it. You came to an Agile users group and you got all excited about it. Maybe you and your little team have tried a couple of things, but you don't know whether this is the best thing for your organization or not. You have no proof. We don't do controlled, double-blind studies in software. Think about that. If the drug companies operated in the same way that we do... We'd be high all the time. Yeah, we are high all the time. We'd be running up to each other saying, Hey, my team tried these little blue pills. They really worked for us. I can get you some. Try it. We have no controlled studies to show that it is not a placebo. Now, is that a bad thing? What do you think? I just told you that Agile might be a placebo. Is that a bad thing? Did I insult you? Did I say, you know, I'm an Agilista. Absolutely, I've been doing Agile development since the early 90s. Is that a bad thing? No. No, it is not a bad thing. It, it doesn't really matter whether we have double-blind controlled studies. This is the best we've got. And it's a very good thing. I recommend it. All I'm saying is, you have no proof. You have no scientific evidence. You have a lot of experience reports. That's what I like to read in IEEE software. That's what I would encourage you to do. We have a lot of good stories, but we have no scientific proof. So if you're going to be successful at introducing an idea to your organization, if you don't believe, if in your heart, I mean, even in the corporate world today, we talk about passion. You don't have that. You won't be able to make it work. There's something in us that sees somebody else coming at us with the idea of agile development or anything else and say, you know, I just don't trust that guy. He is trying to sell us snake oil or something. So if you're not sincere, if you don't believe, others will pick that up. You won't get anywhere. So that's a requirement, the very first pattern, evangelist. And we also know another thing about learning or organizational change, and that is it cannot happen overnight. You can stand back and you can look at a lot of organizations. You can stand back and you can look at history. And you can see countries, nations, that seem to have changed overnight. And we say, well, that's what we want. Let's just make it happen. Let's just move the big ship in a different direction. If you look carefully... That's one of the things Mary Lynn and I did, is you look carefully at history, you'll find long years in many cases, years of preparation, years of small steps, little tiny experiments, let's try this, let's try that, 
before the organization, the country, the big ship, before there was any visible movement at all. These next four patterns we identified as this is the way change happens and it's the way you should use the patterns. Wasn't until much later that we discovered a psychologist named Kolb, K-O-L-B, who said, this is how people learn. You try something, test the waters. You stand back and you say, how did that work? And then you look at the successes, what worked well for us in that little experiment, and then you do it again, step by step. Try something else. Stop. How'd that work? Identify the successes. Repeat. Now, Malcolm Gladwell wrote a wonderful book called The Tipping Point. And what you hope for is that you will take a lot of small steps and at some tipping point, lots of change will happen as a result of your latest little trial run or experiment. But you can't know that that will happen. You can't plan for that. All you can do is take little steps and learn. And of course now we see that's what agile development is all about. It's about a little delivery See how iterations are getting shorter? Realism, realizing finally that you can't wait 30 days to find out. You've got you to deliver now. Two weeks. I was at Amazon last year. They have delivery times of hours. Their iterations are a few hours. So you do a little experiment. Deliver a visible, usable increment. Stop. Take time for reflection. Bring in the stakeholders as part of that. Ask, what do you like? What's really working here? And let's use that information to plan the next small step, and then we'll go ahead with the next increment. That's what Agile development is all about. Agile development has a great connection to learning. We are learning. And then timing. Timing is important. Now, when we wrote the pattern, we thought, okay, well, this is so obvious. You don't want to introduce a new idea right before some big delivery. Guys are working 60, 80 hour weeks. Wait, are, they, are you still doing that? Are you working 60, 80 hour weeks? Not in New York. Okay. That's good. That's good. So back in the olden days, you didn't always have time because there was a lot of pressure right before delivery, things were happening. So that was not a good time to say to your team, hey guys, I got this great idea. Why don't we start doing Scrum? People aren't receptive. You've probably noticed, since you're so rational, that there are good times and bad times to talk to your wife about things, you know? There are times when she's more open to hearing about things than others. Have you noticed that? Oh, yes. Yes, of course. So these also are patterns that work within your family. Timing. My friend Mary Lynn is an academic. She says you would never take the week before final exams to talk about some idea that you have for changing the way you do some stuff in the department. No, a bad timing. That's what we thought it was about. There's a wonderful book by Tom DeMarco. It's called Slack. S-L-A-C-K. Slack. That's what I have in my pants. These pants are just a little too big. And when I move around and they keep slipping around, I hope that's not too embarrassing. I know it's an old lady losing her pants. You don't want to see that. Oh, not good. So it's really about that. Tom DeMarco says if organizations don't have any slack, 
That means they have no breathing space. They can't ever stop and say, ah, let's take a breath. Take a breath. But it's more than that. If organizations have no slack, no time for breathing, they cannot learn. Because it takes time, whether it's agile development or any other new idea, to move into something new. There's a learning curve, there's training, the new tools, all sorts of overhead, and that requires a little breathing space. So this is kind of bad news in today's economy, where we have two kinds of people. We have the people who don't have jobs, and they feel bad. And then we have the people who have jobs, and they feel bad because they have to do more with less. Anybody said that in your organization? Do more with less, that means you are going to work harder and not get paid as much. My husband actually, until he retired last year, worked for a company where they just came in one morning and said, everybody's still working the same number of hours, but we are cutting your pay by 50. That's five zero, 50%. How can they do that? Easy. You have a meeting. You announce it. Did anybody leave the company where my husband worked? What do you think? Not a single person. Working for 50% pay, but still putting in the hours. So companies may not have any slack. There will be no good time. They can't learn. So it's not that they are resistant to change or stupid. They just don't have time to breathe. They have time to think about a better way. That's critical. If there is no good time, you might as well save your energy. So here are a couple of ideas to get started and you're looking at Agile development or anything else, say, well, I don't know anything about Agile development. I don't have my team's busy. What can we do? There's always something you can do. If you're interested in Scrum, you could start by having a daily stand-up. And don't introduce it as the Agile method called Scrum or extreme programming or whatever you're doing. Just say, hey, I've got an idea that might help us understand this latest release. Maybe we could just meet every day at 9 o'clock and we'll have a little circle and we'll just go around the circle and we'll say what we did yesterday and what we're going to do tomorrow and did anything hold you up and maybe we can help each other. Just maybe 15 minutes, a little short meeting. Oh, well, that's a good thing to try out. Just see how it goes. You can always find some little thing, a little tweak. Now the cognitive scientists tell us that if you just change people a little tiny bit, you get them to move in a slightly different direction, then their brain sort of examines that and says, you know, I'm doing something different here. And, and maybe I want to keep on in this direction. I might want to do some more new things. Consistency. Anybody bought a car lately? Do you still have cars in New York City? <laughs> yeah. Did you go into a showroom to buy that car? And if some salesperson came up and gave you the keys, would he turn you loose on the streets out here with a car? No. Oh, maybe you have to go to New Jersey for that. Well, those would be different kinds of cars, though, wouldn't they? Why does a salesperson in an automobile showroom hand over the keys to somebody else? What's he thinking? 
you're just a nice guy and said, hey, want to go for a fun ride here, take this new car and drive around the block. Why does he do that? Because he knows once you're behind the wheel, part of your brain is saying, oh, I'm driving this car. I like this car. I might buy it. Go into a clothing store. What do they do? They say, try it on. Do try it on. Just see how it looks. If you try something, you're much more likely to buy. And that's exactly what you want. Well, we'll just, we'll just try it. Try a little thing here. And move people in the direction you want to go. So right now, everybody's thinking, wait a minute, Linda, this sort of sounds underhanded. Are you teaching us some marketing tricks? Are you teaching us some brainwashing strategies? I was just in China and one of the people in the audience said, is this brainwashing? I said, it is. It is brainwashing. Is that a bad thing? Is that a bad thing? China is. <laughs> so let's let's clear something up here. Not only did we have a misunderstanding about rationality, we thought smart equals rational. Therefore, rational argument convinces other smart people. Therefore, I don't have to do anything else. And there's another little piece to that argument that holds us up, and that is goodness. As somehow we think we're the good guys. We live in New York City after all. We're the good guys. Our ideas are good. So not only is my rational argument sufficient, but because it's a good idea, that should be convincing in and of itself. Goodness. Goodness should win. Come on. Come on. Goodness triumphs. Hey. You mean the good ideas don't always win? The good guys don't always win? Could it be worse than that? Could it be that everyone believes that his ideas are the good ones? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. That belief in goodness has nothing to do with tools. The tools, whether there are tools for brainwashing or that logical PowerPoint bullet, have nothing to do with the idea. Let's look at this next pattern, do food. One of my favorites, isn't it one of your favorites? Yes, we love food. Food is a wonderful thing to do because it's an influence strategy. There's something in us that's hardwired to be more open to people when we're eating. There's a wonderful experiment. It was done with some groups of people about ready to vote on an issue. Half the group got chocolate chip cookies while they were listening to the presentation about the issue. The other group, no cookies for them. Now, here's the question. Which group supported the issue? <coughs> the group that got the cookies, absolutely. Now, the other thing that psychologists do that we don't is they not only do double-blind controlled experiments, they do them over and over and over. That particular experiment has been repeated dozens of times. And what they discovered was the group that got the cookies will support the issue even if it is not a good idea. <laughs> Now, 
Boy, what does that say about our rational brain? That we pay more attention to a chocolate chip cookie than whether or not the issue is worthwhile. So it doesn't have anything to do with whether the idea is good or not. The other thing you might be thinking about is, well, Linda, does it have anything to do with the idea? Does it have anything to do with the food? What do you think? Does it make a difference? What kind of food do you have? Cookies will get you more than celery, so it does matter about the food. The quality of the food is very important. You want to give people food they really like. Not the food they say they want, but the food they really want. You have to know your audience. And that will be convincing much more than the quality of the idea. So if you're still stumbling with that, think about a time in history when perhaps because someone was very good with brainwashing or whatever you want to call these tools, the patterns, I call them the patterns, someone who was a patterns expert was able to convince a fairly large group of people, maybe you could say even an entire country, to do stuff that was a bad idea. You think of a time? I was thinking of Jonestown, I don't know, there are so many examples. Jim Jones, yeah, haul those people off. And then he said, hey, I'm going to make this nice batch of Kool-Aid, and guess what? We're all going to commit suicide together. Now, is that a good idea or what? Doesn't sound like a good idea to me. But he was able to do it. So it doesn't have anything to do with goodness of the idea. It's interesting, psychologists have studied dictators and other people who have led a lot of people to do bad things. And they all say the same thing. I was doing it for good reasons. I'm basically a good person at heart. So we know that in everybody in your organization is an individual person who has a different view on the world. I think that's another stumbling block for us. If you'll look at the research now from the cognitive scientists, it says, we have unique views of the world. It's a wonder we can communicate at all. I don't see things the same way you do. And that's true for every member of your team. So even if you were going to make a nice rational argument, you don't really know how to lead that argument because you don't know what that other person is looking for. So this pattern is critical, personal touch, to realize that individuals see the world differently and their reasons whatever that means for deciding to adopt agile or any innovation are going to be different in fact you've probably heard this expression everybody's asking the same question when they encounter a new idea you know what that question is have you heard this one before what are they asking Yes, what's in it for me? How will Agile help my, my issues? What's this going to do for me? And you, as a, an evangelist for Agile development, you should be prepared to address that because if you don't, it doesn't matter about the goodness of your idea or the nice logical argument or the experience of other people if you can't make a tie to that person. It's called emotional connection. you got to connect. you got to make it real for that person. And that means understanding where they're coming from. Stephen Covey said you have to wear somebody else's moccasins. You have to adopt another's point of view. And that's very difficult. 
especially if you have that barrier anyway that says, no, no, logic is enough, we're all smart here, I don't have to worry about that emotional stuff, we're all rational, that's all I need is a rational argument. So I'm going to go ahead and skip to the, to the end since I, I don't want to run over time. We won't have time for questions, but I will be here the rest of the day and we're going to have all that wonderful time and open space. And if there are any questions that you have about any of the patterns or anything else that you'd like to talk about, why I'll, I'll be here to do that. Let's look at these last two patterns because usually people come up with a question about those people who are resistance, those people who are skeptical, those people who are negative. And, and, and you'll notice the pronouns there are those people. So one thing we know about us, and this is a topic of another talk that I give, is that we're hardwired to divide the world up into us and them. But we do it all the time. We do it 24-7. I think we do it in our sleep. We've got labels on everybody. Well, I, I'm from Nashville, you're from New York. Oh, what? Well, that's the difference right there. I'm old, you're young. Well, big difference. I'm, I'm short, you're tall. Or I'm tall, you're short. Or I'm, may, I'm, I'm female, you're male. Or sometimes it's hard to tell, isn't it? Differences. We are hardwired to do that. Oh, there goes our hope for world peace. So what we do when we hear from somebody who doesn't like agile development or whatever it is that we're trying to introduce, we say, well, those people, and watch your language. You'll start doing that. You'll start saying, those people. Implying an outgroup. Those people don't get it. Those people don't understand what I'm talking about. Those people just don't see how great my idea is. So Linda, I add, whoa, what should we do with all those people? I have even heard managers say, you know, maybe we should fire them. It's like that vice president at Cisco. Those people who won't sign up for extreme programming or whatever it is that we want, let's just get rid of them. Fire them. Solve that problem, wouldn't it? But this pattern suggests there is a better way. It's the title of the book, Fearless Change. And it's not about not being afraid to introduce an idea. It's about not being afraid to listen to those people. One of the most convincing things you can do to a skeptic or a person who's resistant to your idea is to pay attention. So I've searched for a long time for a metaphor, and here's the best one I can come up with. It's to treat that person as though he or she is the wisest person in the world, and that you want to learn everything you can. So play the role of active listener, active learner. Tell me more about that. You say that you don't think shorter iterations will work. Why do you say that? Do you have experience with that? You say we tried something like this in the organization before and it didn't work. I would like to hear about that. What lawyers do to prepare for a defense is to study intently the arguments of the other side. And what we do in software is avoid those people. I can remember doing that myself, running into someone in a hallway and quickly diving into the restroom, thinking, I don't want to talk to that guy. It's seeking them out. It's respecting that other point of view. And what's amazing about this pattern is that 75% of the time, not always, 75% of the time, that respect will listen them 
into being open to you. Often we think this is what having a conversation is. It's like a fencing match. Here's my point. Ha! And the goal of the conversation is to finally end that conversation with, ha! Ha! I win. That gets us nowhere. So I want to encourage you to show respect for resistance. Listen them into agreement. So I'm hoping that you'll have a look at the rest of the patterns. There are 48, and that maybe you'll find some useful patterns that will help you introduce change into your organization so that you will be successful. Thanks for your time. Thank you, thank you so much for opening up our Agile Day with a, uh, with a wonderful presentation by Fearless Change. Let's change a little bit today in our Agile Day, every single one of us with uh, learning through the great presentation. So thanks again. One more round of applause for Lita. Thank you.